All right. But now we'll start with the performance questions. Uh, so the speakers are, the panelists are unprepared and so, so am I. Uh, luckily they, they are experts in that field. So uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, what are the typical performance problems in Rails application, applications and how do you solve them? Uh, we can start with uh, Steven from your experience. Mm. So I feel like most people would probably, their, their minds would go to database bottlenecks. How can I make my queries faster? Um, and one of the interesting things I found, like doing, preparing a talk like this and doing a lot of benchmarks, um, I was reminded of a fact that I learned years ago and it always slips out of my mind and I want to remind all of you. Action view is incredibly fast if you're just rendering a view. And as soon as you call out to a partial, it gets way slower. And most of the applications that I have worked in average like maybe three to six layers of partial calls. And the ERB engine itself, quite fast. But the Rails ERB to actually go and find those files and like compile them, quite slow. And I, distinctly remember I was running some benchmarks and I was like expecting that all of my write benchmarking APIs were going to be slower than my reads because of the linear writes and all this stuff and they were all consistently faster and I looked like what is going on and um, SQLite was way faster than Action View um, and even just introducing I did an experiment I introduced just one partial so I had an index view with I was building a table I pulled out the table row for each post into one partial and it was 40% slower. Um, so, sure, if you've got really slow queries, yeah, go and fix them. But don't lose sight of your depth of partial layers, right? Like, I've got the view, and it's called, I've got the header partial and the header partial, I've got the left partial and the right partial, and the left partial I'm calling the button partial. That is killing your application's performance. Um, okay, uh, Stephen, focus on views. So let's imagine that now that you don't have any views, let's talk only about APIs and um, keeping aside queries that sometimes, of course, you can improve with indexes and everything. Um, I think it's pretty easy for you to forget what's actually happening on those black boxes. And this is something that you need to be very careful when using um, active records and frameworks in general. So this is why this kind of talks like the ones Stephen did, like going to the deep details of what's going on is important because it's super common for you to simply load a big collection in memory. And it's super common seeing uh, when I do code reviews with my team, it's pretty common to oh, please replace this each with a find each. You know, you're changing five letters, but instead of you loading 1,000 items in memory and it iterating on them, you're doing it on a paginated zero and you're not going to explode. So. I think that this uh, critical mind of really understanding of what high-level languages are doing because they're super easy to write and they almost read like pseudocode, but it's important to remember that they're actually doing stuff and it's important to understand what they are doing. Sometimes it's very tiny changes on the way that things are written that make a big difference on what's actually being, what's actually being run. And there's a second thing that's added to that, which is also, um, okay, these things take a long time, let's run everything as background jobs. And then you start serializing a big object and putting it to run in backgrounds and then suddenly you have your background queue running slower than if it was running foreground because you are spending most of your time in serializing objects. So, um, so this is, just have this critical mind of like, know exactly what you are using and to use the tool the best way the running a background job past just you, you know numbers IDs reload your objects from from inside and know know that sometimes unserializing a big object in memory is going to be slower than actually just running a database query to load it so those are two other cases that I rem remember that I've been through that I would add to what Stephen said. All right, uh, Maciej, let me repeat the question for you: What are typical performance problems in Rails applications? How do you solve them? Oh, that's, that works. Uh, that's a wide question. 
I think that my colleagues answered most most of them. Um, what I saw uh, up to date is mostly related to fetching too much data or doing too many queries uh, to the uh, to the database. What could I could add? Uh, it's a very specific uh, case, but sometimes you need to fetch data from two sources, and when you do this, you need to basically you need to re-implement re some database algorithms on your application level, because for instance, you need to join the data from the two, from two sources. Because I don't know, you have uh, uh, transactions from one source and users from another source, and you want to match them. And if you do a nested loop, it's rather slow. And if you employ a hash, you're basically start re, uh, re implementing database. Uh, that's one thing that could happen. Another thing is that if you fetch uh, a lot of data, let's say from Elastic, and you keep it keep it in hashes, um, and you want to add just a few fields to those deeply nested hashes, this operation is uh, rather costly. That's our experience. Uh, I spent once uh, half a day trying to optimize such an update. Fortunately, we were able to make a bypass by talking to the product and, and showing less data instead of, of trying to optimize it. Yeah, that's, that's, actually <clears throat> that's actually one of the common problems that I also uh, noticed in the industry. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll just uh, pop up one more question of uh, based on what you said. So what do you think about mm, the models that we have that are often driven by the framework that we use, that most of us love? And uh, how do you see the, this uh, correlation of the growing models? For example, a user class that has 57 uh, columns in the database. Does it affect performance from your perspective? I'm uh, asking all of you, by the way. Um, and uh, what goes on top of that is that we also have to do many joins sometimes to so, uh, show some more sophisticated page, uh, some report, and so on. How does that um, how, what do you think about that problem in general? Uh, if I may start, if I really need to show very specific data for, or use very specific data, let's say I have a background job that shows data to an external service, uh, I'm very okay of not using models or hacking the models, uh, fetching the data that I need, wrapping it in a structure or anything sim simple and then sending it away because i don't use i don't need all the mm, nine cities that active record provides um when i have like a regular business logic when i need to actually use the method uh methods defined on models it's a different case um then i i would probably think but actually i I'm not very sure that the fact that there are 50 fields or 60 fields is a, that big of a problem. Yeah, I think to add to that, I this is advice that I'm giving my past self eight years ago, which is like to really, really focus on pragmatics and to deep, deeply think about like what situation am I in like what is the uh, the context of this problem and to not fall into the trap of trying to find a one-size-fits-all solution um, so are there situations where like the difference between a hundred microseconds and one millisecond is actually important to the business yes there are are there many of them no there aren't um, and adding a whole bunch of complexity uh, into a situation that doesn't actually need it is going to cause you more pain than not. Um, so I think like on average, most problems, no, I don't think that models are affecting performance. Um, but it requires really knowing the problem that you're working in, like what your performance budget is, why it is that way. Um, doing enough benchmarking to see like, you know, what is the cost of having like um, this extra column? Um, should I, for example, one, one decision I've made in some apps is like, should I pull out 
a JSON payload column into a separate table so that I only retrieve it when I actually need it and it's like a, a polymorphic table to anything? Or do I just leave it on those tables? Um, and I did it once because I thought, that's smart, you know? Why load extra data? And it was a massive pain in the ass. Uh, and uh, saved me a millisecond. Like it, it, in that app, it wasn't actually useful, and I was annoyed at my past self within three months. Yeah, yeah I would, I'd show that. At first, maybe take a step back, because in many situations, to actually question and do some nego negotiation, even with front ends and API clients or whatever, in many cases, you don't necessarily need to load everything at once. So I don't think that the data structure necessarily, if it's growing too much, is the problem, but it's more how you use it. So. The, you know, there are strategies on the API client side to build, build and load things on demand and not everything in, at once. And you should probably have room to discuss those approaches because this is, after all, it's user experience as well. So uh, loading things on, on, on demand is super important. And sometimes I bring those things up because I've worked a long time on the front end side as well with uh, React. Um, but when you do need to load uh, all those things, there are, in some cases, adding a new column is going to be faster because it can be a counter cache column, for example, and it's going to save you um, a lot of time doing some calculation. But again, not even counter cache should be uh, treated as some kinds of silver bullets that always work. Um, sometimes it will be faster to just do that calculation as you need. So measuring and really understanding the problem at hand and you may find the right solution. Um, I Usually I say my answer to almost all those things is depends and understanding the context, which includes budget um, and, and, and other things, is super important as, as well. But imagine that at some point the database grows too much in terms of number of records and you do a bunch of queries there. That really gets really, really huge, which may be a good problem to have, you know, if it's, this means that your business is growing or because you're storing more than what you should. Um, I'm just mentioning that in the past, working on a very big application, I had to use partitioning. So just to mention here on one solution, in many cases, partition is not even needed and you know, in the way that databases are implemented. If you have a good like index that you can isolate your data, it can already work totally fine. Um, but, uh, but there is a solution if things r get really, really, really big. But I think there are many other steps that you can take before getting to that point. All right, uh, thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, not. Uh, all right, let's go to the second question. Uh, the second question is, how to triage performance problems? Which are the best to be solved first? Uh, we can start with Maciej this time. Mm. I think that, that I'll just repeat, I, I just second what Kaya said. It's, um, to triage it, I, I guess that we need to talk to the business. Uh, what's their pain? And if they feel a pain that something is working too slow, that's the first thing to do. Um, but there is a caveat. <clears throat> At least in my experience, it's very easy to tech talk them and they complain after a month of complaining, oh, the site is too slow and listening, oh, the site is slow because we show a lot of data, right? Because we, we have a complex application. Um, they stop complaining, and sometimes it's uh, it's our call uh, to realize that something is wrong. Um, hmm. My my heuristic is that if I work on something on a part of application, at there is a request that's slower than a second, at least I take a look because maybe it's an easy win. Uh, so that's my first answer. Uh, leave the place uh, in a better shape that you uh, that you show it that you that you seen it. There is one interesting thing in what you said. So you mentioned that um, that that the page may be complex and that you need to fetch a lot of data. What's the biggest issue in that problem? Is that the amount of data we're fetching, the way we structure our SQL query? Is that the rendering part? From your perspective. Uh, from my perspective, um, I do work on application that shows a lot of data because we 
we have complex analytics. Mm -hmm. So that could be slow. Um, the biggest issue is that we uh, that I've seen so far, or the most common, is that we load too much data. We load data that's not required because uh, it's cheaper not to implement pagination, for instance. Because I don't love, it's not just about showing page and the number of pages, but if you implement it, you need to add a search, or you need to do the proper sorting on the database. So it's more expensive. So it's an easy cost, cost to cut. Uh, and then your application starts to be very slow because somebody decided that they, lead, they would deliver, de deliver their ticket uh, without pagination and it's, it will be okay. So yeah, I think that the most common thing I've seen so far is, is about showing, is sending too much data at once. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steven, what's your perspective? The first question on the, the latter one. Yeah, so for triaging performance issues, I strongly recommend um, I'm going to use business language. I'm already annoyed. Um, time boxing exploration, right? So like a problem comes in and the goal is to find the highest leverage opportunities. Like right? where can I put in an hour of work and like get a big performance boost? And it's really, especially with performance, like it's, it's often quite unintuitive and our guesses are often wrong. But if we just try to do the full fix, like the optimization, it, you know, sometimes it can take hours. It's really useful. And you can get quite good at it. Um, and to get to a place where like, you can take 10 to 30 minutes to just pop in and get a sense of like, OK, could I spend two hours and save a second here? Or is it going to take me five days to save 100 milliseconds? And if you take the time to get decently fast at like that kind of exploration to triage, like, okay, where, let me actually concretely find high leverage opportunities. And then you go and optimize three high leverage places. Like that is an incredibly valuable use of time. Um, so those like quick explorations, right? Like just take a bunch of them and, and, and check them out. Uh, on the second question, I'll just say, I really don't know, and I'm not trying to be uh, a shill, but I've never had performance bottlenecks at the database layer, guys. It's so fast. <laughs> These things are operating in microseconds. It's like, what a gift. Uh, so for me, it's always the view layer. But you know, for everyone else, you're <laughs> sending queries over the network like animals. <laughs> um, so maybe that's your problem. I don't know. For me, it's never been mine. Uh, that's because we have more than a megabyte of data. <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, you mentioned uh, for in the second question, I mean, uh, in the first, in the, the other one, that uh, you not, will not optimize for one second or 100 milliseconds, but uh, let's change the perspective a little bit. What if we have a page that is timing out for certain, uh, for certain customers? that are annoyed by, the, by that and are willing to quit, for example. And let's say that those are very expensive enterprise customers that we cannot afford to lose. Fix that. <laughs> how? <laughs> like, how do, you, how do you triage it? I mean, that, that, that's as much an art as it is a science, but um, I, th I remember there's another question about tools, but like there's there's a few different general classes of tools. So the load testing tool that I was using, OHA, um, pretty simplistic. Um, it's like fancy curl, um, but it's going to give you a sense of from the response side, like your general um, response times, uh, and then the on the other side, like having some kind of monitoring, um, you know, Kyle gave a lot of great examples that aren't just specific to GraphQL. Like you can plug those tools into any Rails application, um, and then it takes a little bit of practice to just find like you know, hop in, hop into a Rails console and try a few things out, get a sense of what kinds of variables make sense to to tweak 
see what kind of responses you're getting. You can just use the Ruby like benchmark block to to start to get a little bit of a sense of where things are, and then you just dive deeper as you find signal. Okay, thank you, uh, Kyle. Yeah. Hello. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, to add to that, first, understanding the business is super important because depending on your public and what you're trying to achieve, where you are operating, who are your users, 100 milliseconds is fine. Depending on the other use case, one milliseconds mile maybe not. Um, so understand that is super important. Understand the different layers also as well, because when it gets to the backend side, maybe it's already too late. There is there are opportunities for you to optimize that on a layer above on the front end on requesting less data for 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 example. So I remember one time that we were running a project in Togo. And our web application with, you know, a few kilobytes of bundled JavaScript, it would take a long time to load in a place where the network is very poor. So why mind about, you know, those queries are taking that time if not even the first bundle that loads your application is able to be rendered in the browser. So understanding on all these steps and how to optimize each of them before maybe optimizing the wrong place. I think it's super important. This is why all those different tools um, that operate at the different layers are important. There will be no single tool that you're able to measure everything from you know from the um, most user-facing interface to the, to the lowest level, and to be sure that you are optimizing the right place. Um, if um, performance optimization and monitoring is not something that's happening, on a ongoing basis during your development process, probably the easiest way to start is, as Stephen was saying, try to find the low hanging fruits. And, um, uh, you know, like, why optimize a query that's taking three seconds, but it doesn't represent much of your request. It's not impacting those many users. So find that, so try to find exactly those easy wins where you can have biggest impacts on users with lower efforts. So this way you can you know, have some uh, thing to be shipped faster and having some impacts before. Um, and uh, yeah, mentioning tools because this was the, the the original question, right? I think performance can't go um, alone. It needs to always be connected to metrics. So you need really um, what are the most used features because maybe the solution to performance problem will be deprecated this feature, you know? It's it's just exploded and no one is really caring about it. So why why you need to 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 maintain that? So we have a mantra in our team that the best code is no code. So and like focus on deleting code, not on writing code, especially when you're maintaining an old uh, database. So maybe sometimes the 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 fix to the performance probably will be on redo this thing or get rid of it. Do it in a different way and not necessarily try to fix it. Um, so the tools I showed some of them, they operate at different levels. We've been pretty successful with Honeycomb. Most of our stuff runs on AWS, so we rely a lot on AWS tools as well. Um, integrations with CloudWatch for alerting and monitoring and uptime that can um, also track performance from different regions. You know, so you don't have this problem where a user somewhere in the world is reporting, oh, this thing is not loading for me. And you have the worst answer that is, that is, oh, it's loading fine here. So where is the problem? Uh, so having tools that are able to measure performance from different parts of the, w of the world is also important to help you debug those issues um, more easily. So you have more, co more context to work on them. All right, thanks. Uh, this is a little bit forward to the next question. Uh, so which tools do you use to monitor triage and fix performance problems? Uh, let's start with the tools for the database. Uh, maybe anything else that you haven't uh, mentioned yet in your presentation or uh, in your previous answer? Yeah, so continue what I was saying. Um, so Honeycomb, um, Uptime, CloudWatch tools in general. Um, for the database, we use PG Analyzer to generate some insights on database performance. It can, you know, just uh, send some insights on some easy wins. Like sometimes it's really, um, it, uh, sometimes we tend, I think, to overlook the simplest thing and we try to think about the most complex and complicated reasons for things. And sometimes really you may forget to add an index to a column. It happens. 
So, uh, so those tools um, help with that as well, um, PG Analyzer for that. Um, specifically for GraphQL, um, as I mentioned, um, Apollo is, is, uh, is useful to generate some data, Grafana. Um, yeah, just to mention a few, but I'll let my colleagues add to that. Okay, thank you. Maciej, same question. Um, <coughs> right now, we are using OpenTelemetry. It means that we write uh, statistics, uh, performance statistics to the logs, and then there is a, um, a server for metrics consuming them. There are several uh, servers that can use it. The good thing is that you don't have to change anything in your code if you don't like your uh, metrics platform. You switch the platform. In the past, of course, I used Datadog and New Relic, but you know, there are very lengthy blog posts about the pricing of those tools, so uh, you need to know if you, you can afford them. Mm, one thing that wasn't mentioned uh, by Kayo is that uh, when we were optimizing a crucial uh, GraphQL-based uh, API, we added our custom telemetry, uh, our custom instrumentation, and for every request that was sent, there weren't that many, so we can we we were able to afford this. We were logging uh, some stats, including the uh, the request time, and because of this, it, we were logging it on on the client side, and because of this, uh, we were able to pinpoint the slow requests. We were able to check them in Kibana, uh measure them properly, aggregate them, and uh, and triage. Uh, by saying, okay, our next slow request is this one. And because we were logging everything, including the params, uh, we were able to reproduce the exact slow request locally because we were using the same params and we were optimizing them locally. Uh, it was great because the feedback loop, loop was very tight. Uh, we weren't guessing because after adding some optimizations, we were able to do the um, acceptance test locally. All right. Yeah, I think that these are really great answers for, like, I don't know, big, meaningful apps. I'll take the perspective of uh, smaller, less meaningful apps. Um, because there's lots of them, too. And they're important, and you can't, uh, you, <laughs> you certainly can't pay for Datadog. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I have been using something uh, personally, and I'm still in the process of trying to package it up as a gem, but um, Rails is pretty well instrumented. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of active support notifications that are woven throughout all of Rails. Um, so, in the biggest small app that we have at work. Um, I am just subscribing to active support notifications and piping those into a SQLite database and then I have a route uh, that just basically shows me that SQLite database and uh, as I go I'm like I kind of want to do a simplistic graph of this part of it. Um, but I, I think that especially as you're getting started um, leaning into like, how far can I get with what the framework already gives me and like, as I just started reading about it I'm like wow there's there's a lot of instrumentation in Rails that it actually gives you a lot of information um, if you just grab it and put it somewhere and even if you need to or want to use Postgres as your main database like that's probably a reasonable use for SQLite to just sort of like have a little pocket of analytics that you uh, map to a route. Um, I think that there are those kinds of minimalist options for when you're just starting out or if you have smaller projects or sort of internal back office projects. Um, but for business, I, I would just say their answers. Yeah, I, I would add to this because you said about this publishing this endpoint with, uh, with stats. It's basically what you do when you have Prometheus, because you, you publish your stats and Prometheus reads them, 
you probably have Prometheus because your infra guys set them up for them. So ask them nicely to reuse it and publish metrics there and use all the niceties related to Prometheus, Grafana and, and stuff. It's, it's very useful when you use it. Last point for um, those tools that come for free that you can get started and get useful insights. Um, for background processing in particular, Sidekick itself has a pretty good insights interface that comes with it. So you can see the queues latency and that kind of stuff. And for regular Rails background jobs, active support notifications are surprisingly useful on giving insights on where are the bottlenecks. So you can definitely start to, with, with those. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have any other tools, recommendations when it comes to solving performance issues uh, with CPU, memory, I/O, uh, network latency, or uh, sorry, not network latency, just a network or uh, front-end generation, uh, specifically if we have too large uh, DOM? Start with uh, Steven. I don't think so. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of that optimization work. I don't have like uh, particularly clever or smart answers, so I'm not going to make up an attempt at a clever or smart answer. I bet that they do, though. Um, the next layer that we can talk about are the profilers. Um, after some break, I got back to profilers that we have in the Ruby community, and folks, they are great. I just check Speedoscope and just check Rprof. You can get very nice graphs, very nice stats, uh, with a very little effort, and you're able to, uh, when you decide which endpoint you want to or which spec you want to optimize, you can get very detailed stats of which methods takes the most of time, and focus there, uh, just to avoid guessing. Um, yeah, so I, I haven't been doing a lot of like front-end profiling, for example, but uh, it's something that we care about. Oh, hello. <laughs> it's back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, something that we care about, for example, is bundle size, as, as I mentioned. And on the front-end world, it's so easy to do an M NPM install and add a dependency for which you need one function and then you're adding kilobytes to your turbine so there's some kinds of tree shaking and um, tools to audit the dependencies the dependencies that you're adding to the code because um, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's the only thing that I would add to that but in general for uh, for performance um, not tools that we use but I think that in many cases where I see in practice that it's hard to reproduce some of the scenarios um, so that you can really know if you're really solving the problem so um, trying to like how are so this is why like logging the parameter values is important for you to be able to reproduce um, we use sentry a lot for error catching in all our layers from the front end to the to the back end and it's useful to include information not only for debugging but also for uh, profiling performance issues so um, Try to be sure that you can improve your toolkit in order to be able to reproduce the problems and not only to fix them. Otherwise, you never know how, if you really fix them, you need to push a fix and cross your fingers. That's all. And just to say the name, um, I haven't used it to like actually solve a production uh, performance issue, but there's a new profiler from John Hawthorne from the Rails core called Vernier, um, V-E-R-N-I-E-R. Um, which I think he'll talk about in his keynote at RailsConf. Um, but he's been doing a lot of work on that and, and trying to make that a uh, particularly useful tool. Um, so in addition to those profilers, which are very much battle tested, um, I've, I've watched a couple of his live streams on it, but I wanted to at least, if you haven't heard of it, you should hear of it. Um, and I think it's definitely worth checking it out if you need a profiler. And remember, you heard about that here. Uh, all right, next question. What would be your heuristics uh, when to finish performance optimizations, right? Because um, cost is also important. And as you already mentioned a few times, uh, we cannot 
we need, we need to make a decision, right? If we want to make, uh, say, 50% of optimization and then just stop and say, okay, it's good enough versus just going bananas and spending weeks to get this perfect solution that doesn't exist. What are your heuristics? Uh, we can start with Steven. Yeah, so this goes back to what I was saying before. Like, you, you have to define uh, performance budgets. Um, there's, there's maybe not even a lot of value in trying to do a lot of performance optimizations before you have done that and, like, had conversations with the rest of your team, had conversations with um, people from product, had conversations with people on the business side um, to get some general agreement, right? Like, do we want... You might say, uh, if we have a regular web application, I'd say, we want every single page to be below 300 milliseconds. Or maybe for your application, you say, these pages need to be below 100 milliseconds, but those pages can be up to a second. Um, or, if I, like, it, it really can vary a lot. Um, but if you start off with those conversations and you actually have um, some defined and agreed upon budgets, it makes this question actually now much easier. You say, like, okay, are we um, under budget or are we not? And if we're not, we've made an agreement that we'll be under it, so we have to do the work to get under it. Um, and if you're really, really struggling you're like, to, to get under that budget, then you can start having pragmatic conversations. Say, like, hey, remember when we had that conversation and we agreed every single page would be below 100 milliseconds? I think I was stupid to agree to that. And let me tell you why, and I would like to renegotiate. Um, and that's perfectly, that's a very reasonable thing to do. Context change, you get more information, but um, performance budgets are really valuable. It's a valuable concept to, to bring into this kind of conversation. Yeah, that sounds very good. Um, I think that's one of the biggest waste of resources can be trying to start doing performance optimization before even defining any SLAs with your team. So if you don't have service level agreements, what can like anything is fine, right? Or um, or you don't know exactly where you need to put most of the energy. So I would focus more first on starting on defining those SLAs with the teams, product, business, see what's actually feasible technically and what actually fits the budget that you have, and then you go into 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 the tooling. Otherwise, you may be putting energy on things that are not even needed and are not even perceivable, depending on the context that you are working. Hey, imagine that this is something that happens in the background of your application. You got it blazing fast, but the user doesn't even notice because, you know, it's happening. It's just updating one simple component of a page is, is synchronously. So um, um, understanding those, have those agreements defined across all the teams and then getting to work on them. Um, I think is the, the most, th th this is the only thing that I think is a com it's common to almost all the cases. You need to have those SLAs defined, defined budget defined, and then depending on it, any combinations of those, there are different approaches to them. Um, sorry. Uh, let me ask you about uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, so imagine that I'm a business and I have no clue about what is SLA or other stuff you mentioned, and uh, I have this very important page, it's slow, I want it fast, and I want it now. How do we talk? You want it now? I want it fast, and I want it now. Yesterday. <laughs> Cache the whole page, <laughs> update it on every update, but it's everything cached on Cloudflare, and no. I already heard uh, about cache, and I know it introduces another problems. <laughs> Um, no, just uh, okay. How would you um, how would you negotiate with uh, such a person? Because it's uh, not always our business is educated, right? We sometimes we just talk with people that have no idea what's SLA, why we need some budget. They just right. want it to work. They just want it to work good, right? Yeah, the, I mean, there is no easy answer to that. I think there is a lot that goes into culture and education of a team. And sometimes it's going to take a while to get to a point where those conversations can really happen at a level that people really trust each other and what is is going on there. Um, but uh, but it's better to have those conversations in the beginning and set expectations early in the process, even if it's going to create some internal stress at that time, than just agreeing to whatever comes and then have everything down and clients clients complaining. It would be even worse. So setting expectations in the beginning, even if it takes some work, negotiation, ed ed education, and building a more mature culture in a team 
it's better to invest time there while everything is internal when after everything explodes in the face of users. All right, thanks. Maciej? Um, I agree to, with the principle of, of uh, performance budget. Um, still, I haven't seen them in the wild. So if you could show me them, I, I've seen them in the zoo, right? In blog posts. I haven't seen them in the wild, so if you can show me them, I I'll be happy to, to see them. Uh, I believe that many of us are in the organization that don't have the uh, defined performance budget. Um, and it's a great thing to, to push towards them, but what to do before we get there, and our application is slow. You know, mm, if we take the this craftsmanship approach, that you click on a page and you think, think, oh my cow, this is so slow. I just can't leave and saying I'm working on this application. Um, then uh, this ad hoc, ad hoc approach while getting to the budgeting uh, is just this, the, this, the fact of life. And what I do then is that I declare, I call my shots I declare pub publicly, I need to optimize this page and I will spend half a day or a day on optimizing this. And uh, if I'm in a new team, I say to them, when I uh, get to the end of the time box, yell at me that I have to finish because otherwise I won't. Uh, or I'm t I say to myself, that's my time box, I will finish it by then or I'll just drop it because yeah, it's it's an endless work. So the answer to the original question is where to finish current optimization task, uh, where you run out of time, and this time should be defined defined ahead because uh, performance optimization could be an endless effort. So you can safely do it in an iterative manner. This week I'll test this hypothesis. Next week I'll test another hypothesis. And without stopping the world, I'm making the app a bit better every week or every sprint. Yeah, and just to add to that, because that is a very good point. Um, we certainly do not have like a knowledge base page with a table that has page and then like agreed upon SLA. Um, <laughs> very true. It's it's much fuzzier, and it's it's worth um, making that very explicit that it's often much fuzzier. And it's much more about having conversations and having this kind of language and, and having general agreement. Like So like our main application, we have um, a portal which is for customers from, from the companies. We have a portal for testers. And we have a portal for internal workers. Um, and we have a lot of more than one second load pages in the internal employee portal. Uh, and for the tester portal and for the customer portal, we're like much more uh, attentive. And the customer portal, we're more, more attentive to, right? Um, and so there are fuzzy and rough performance budgets of like, um, and this goes back to education and culture and like having some of these conversations to say like, you know, the, the human eye can't even tell the difference between one millisecond and 100 milliseconds. Like, if we're, if we're below 100 milliseconds on the customer portal, we're doing really good. Um, if we're above a second, we're doing really bad. Uh, so call us out if it's above a second. Um, and the, the craftsmanship approach is also um, an important part of culture. And just like, especially if you are uh, in some degree of leadership in the team, uh, demonstrating that, like leading by example to say like, I care about things and also showing like the right things to care about to say like, I don't care about, I mean, there are certain situations where you should, like I wanna shave off 10 milliseconds on this query, but show like, it, this was really annoying as for me as a user to like watch the page load for over a second. And um, I want to have this empathetic user centric mindset and I want to demonstrate like, I care enough about it to set aside the work and also to demonstrate here's how you communicate with your team and with the business to say, I'm going to make a trade off right now to stop doing this work, to do this work. I'm going to do it responsibly within a time budget. Like I'm not just going to spend the next two weeks. Like I'm going to explore and see if I can do it in three hours. 
if I can find a high leverage solution here. Like these are the kinds of things it's, it's much fuzzier and you, yeah, you're never going to have like this perfect table, but you can start to bring that into your culture. And as that spreads, like it really is quite remarkable how well you can end up as uh, a team and, and as a product, if you just sort of um, build the habits of talking about these things, caring about these things, caring about them from the right perspective of like what's actually happening and experienced by the users who are your users, where are they at? Like those are the those are the really valuable parts. Thank you. Um, so another question: Whoever is first can start answering. What's your most complex performance problem that you have ever solved? I killed production once. <laughs> <laughs> How? Completely. <laughs> so. Uh, we were optimizing API, right? I told you. It was a wonderful project. And I applied performance optimization, but we were switching from REST to GraphQL. I, I'm telling this story on some kind of presentation, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> and I noticed that there is, there is a security issue with our API, and we don't sanitize parameters properly. So I sanitize its parameters in both branches. And I deployed to production, and I, uh, we had a very good feature flux. Uh, so I enabled GraphQL for, ten, I don't know, for 10% of the traffic to see the impact. And something was getting off, but I, was, I believe that it's not me, so I didn't care until it exploded. Uh, yeah, Infra guys solved me. Uh, they reverted my deploy, um, but what was the point? Why was um, it wasn't complex, but it was serious? I sanitized too much, and I removed all the params from the from the filter, and we were fetching data from an external service with sanitized params. We were basically doing a uh, select star from the table. Um, joined with some other tables, semicolon, without the where part. So we were loading the, Classic. the whole database to memory, then serializing it to hashes, then serializing it to... No, we, I think we didn't get to the point to serialize it to, to the network. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you have to debug melted. that, or that was easy to spot? Um, I actually can't really remember anything I did more than two years ago, if if six months ago. But um, genuinely, probably the whole thing I, I stepped through in my talk. I, I uh, have been trying to figure out like where are the hotspots and the pain points in Rails applications, specifically with SQLite. And um, I believe it or not, I cut a lot out of that talk um, <laughs> around view layer optimization and using different SQLite drivers. So I spent um, a few weeks really sort of digging into the weeds uh, and tried to take as much of the highest leverage um, steps and like what I actually was seeing and thinking and like moving my way through in that talk. Um, and if I've done anything more complicated more than two years ago, I, I genuinely have no idea. Um, yeah, I have this problem with memory as well. But so maybe there is not the most complex performance problem that I had to deal with. But there's this one I remember that was pretty interesting because it made the team learn. So uh, we had this big elections project in Brazil 2022, and uh, our API was connected to a big WhatsApp channel. Um, so it was receiving a lot of messages at 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 the same time. And there was one endpoint for text similarity that's called an external machine learning service running as a AWS Lambda function. And uh, we cared a lot about scaling the Rails API to handle lots of requests that were coming, that was fine. But then not this other service, which was a Python service um, running on Lambda, which at our general usage, to handle all requests is just fine. So the Rails API would receive a a request to make another request to the Python service, those requests were happening synchronously, which is we didn't notice before because it was just you know it was just too fast that you didn't even care. But at scale it starts to be a to be a problem because 
and we saw contention in the database connected to the Rails service, but we didn't saw activity happening on the database. So uh, the, the, there are too many connections, but no activity on the database. This was because the HTTP request to the Rails service was opening a transaction, starting a transaction, opening a database connection. That connection was opened while the request was made to the other service, which was the one having a scalability problem. And that, and that connection remains open to the database doing nothing. So we saw, so other requesters were not able to open a connection to the database because the pool was full. Uh, and while the external service was processing. So there was a simple solution there of like, make the request to the external service, but close the database connection because this request is not doing anything in the database. We don't even need it, but it's going to happen by default. Um, so this was an interesting uh, performance debugging session when like there were two services involved, database pool full with no database activity happening. So that was pretty interesting. All right, thanks. Uh, so th it's time for the last question. Um, and there are questions from the audience. So how to deal with the big data sets on the index endpoint that contains many filters? For example, 20 plus filters that could be mixed in any combination. Silver bullets only. Uh, well, it depends. We got a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more seriously, it depends how much data you have. In many cases, it's just enough to use the Postgres, and in other cases, use SQLite um, with proper indexing. <laughs> you almost convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> with proper indexing, and to load tests it properly, uh, and locally and on staging and production and to measure everything, and if you ad outgrow it, use some kind of secondary index. My solution of choice is Elasticsearch, but you can use something else and filter there. The issue is that sometimes you you would have to maybe join data between Elastic and Postgres in app, as I said before, and it might be a performance bottleneck. And yeah, I will leave the obvious answer that you should cache everything because yeah. I would just index everything properly and you should be okay. Yeah. And just to add a little bit to that, I would imagine that um, when he says like big data, it's worth like, we're talking probably hundreds of gigabytes, right? Like Postgres, you know, oh, 30 gigabytes. It's not, it's not a problem. That's a small amount of data. That's tiny data. That's not big data. Um, so don't, prematurely optimized, he's like, oh my god, I see a GB, like how, I must need Elasticsearch, like, um, these databases are really powerful pieces of technology. Um, the other thing is, it's very um, often that we presume a high degree of complexity and a high degree of randomness, we're like, okay, I've got 20 filters and they can come in any combination, like, ah, oh, there's no way I could... All the combinations, I would need like a thousand you know, indices and that's way too many, it's gonna be a massive problem. In reality, you have a very high chance of having really hot clusters of combinations of filters, put it in production, have monitoring, find the hot clusters, like this combination of three filters is, you know, the Pareto principle is like actually quite real in a lot of places and you could probably find three to six indices that would make 80% of your queries run really, really, really fast. And then the rest of them, you have them run relatively slow. Um, try to keep everything in one table. Like if you can minimize joins, that's gonna help. But um, just to add those two caveats, like big data is whatever number is in your head for big data, like probably double it. Um, and by the time you actually have to deal with this problem in two years, probably you need to double that number again because hardware is increasing at a, at a solid rate. And um, just because technically there's a lot of combinations doesn't mean that actually you have to like put an index on all of them. I just see what actual usage patterns are and I bet you, you will see a Pareto distribution and you can apply a small number of indices. Sorry, because I heard a heresy. 
Um, you don't need a single table if you have proper database engine because Postgres handles pretty well up to 20 joins, I guess. So yeah, don't be afraid. So you are against data denormalization? I'm all for data, uh, sorry, uh, what you just said, I lost a word, uh, denormalization. Yes. Uh, but that's not required in many cases. Joints are really, really okay. Yeah, in most cases, I think you can probably do totally fine with a well-designed database with the proper indexes in place and the joints, and they are just going to work fine. Um, there is this, maybe, a hey, everyone is using Elasticsearch. We should probably put in a Elasticsearch on top of that. In most cases, this is going to be true. Um, you know, there are many cases that, of course, Elasticsearch is going to be the right answer, especially for doing proper search, full text search, and, you know, things that Elasticsearch can really um, help with. Um, but uh, depending on the volume and the operations that you're doing, you can have almost the same performance with a well-designed and architected database. Um, and to the point, again, you can always take a step back. Uh, you, ha you have an interface where a user can apply 20 filters at once. Is this reasonable? So it's, uh, um, in many I one point we had something like that we knew that was not common, but it could happen because the interface allowed for that, but no one was really using it based on user metrics. And then the interface was just changed to like after 10 feet. I don't remember the name, but it was like uh, you extended the limits, please make something that is more. Um, and and then you just control that on what the user and what the API can actually handle. So this is the kinds of limitation that we needed to put. Uh, in some cases, we think about rate limiting only when we, we are implementing APIs for an external consumption. Um, but uh, even for you know and interfaces and other clients to an API that's more internal, having those those guard rails is also going to save a lot of headache, and then you don't need to improve for a situation that's going to happen 1% of the time. All right, thank you. And we have run out of time, so uh, please give a applaud to our panelists. Thank you very much, guys. That was really interesting.